It's that Seagulls football show Starring J.J. Blue And Alex Stewart And your host Joe Devine The Seagull football show Yes, welcome to the show where we answer the questions that you've asked us Now if you'd like us to answer one of your questions in a future show Just pop it in the comments below But for now, let's begin Okay, David Kai on YouTube asks why do you think Deli Alley have seen such struggles? JJ. So Deli Alley's career hasn't gone quite as we thought it might have, especially after he started so well at Spurs. This is his stats he sees during his career. And as you can see, it's gone progressively worse than he's played progressively less. This is not a good thing. And I think there are a few reasons uh, for this. We can see that he was scoring lots of goals here, and it, I think it's a lot to do with his position. And uh, just to confirm that he is definitely getting worse. If we look at his FIFA rating from the last few FIFA games, <laughs> we can see that here, when he uh, first, I think he was MK Don's here maybe, he was a 72, then he got better. This is the peak years of Deli Alley, still held him in high regard, and then he got worse. This is what he's currently at as we film. And I'm going to show you why I think that is now. Now, Deli has obviously gone to Everton, and that's where he's playing at the moment, and he has been best as a 10, but the player role is very important here. So normally a 10 might be like a playmaker, but Deli Ali is very much a second striker who does best when he gets beyond uh, the forward and actually ends up being something like a 4-4-2 kind of player, so as a striker alongside here. Now, often at Spurs when he was there, you'd find that Kane would drop deeper to get in the ball, and the touch maps would show this, and Deli Ali would be the furthest forward on a, any average position chart. And that's when he's best, being able to get on the end of crosses and header uh, balls into the goal, when he can float in from a deeper starting position, or being able to just improvise off the cuff. One of the things he's very best at was coming up with little bits of skill around the edge of the box, because uh, he'd be able to float in and around here. But as Spurs' system changed, like a 4-3-3, 4-2-3-1, what also happened with Deli Alley was he doesn't do a lot of the defensive work that you need him to, and it's uh, something that's been written about him a lot in various publications, is that he didn't do the work in training, maybe cut some corners, things like that. There's a very famous scene in the Spurs documentary on Amazon where Joseph Mourinho pulls him in and says, I think you'll regret it if you don't... Uh, Kind of buck up your ideas. There wasn't just Mourinho who dropped him. Deli Ali was said to try really hard to come back in a pre-season under Mourinho, so he was ready to go. He was going to just prove himself and be the player that we know he can be. But after getting a few starts under Mourinho, he then was hooked at halftime one game and didn't really appear. And we can see now that Ali has been trying really hard to do the things that people say he doesn't do. Because where he was at his peak when he had a good FIFA rating, now uh, this is what Ali's been over the past kind of 365 days according to FB Ref. And the things he's best at, or the things he does most I should say, are these parts at the bottom which are the defensive things. He's working hard, he's doing the work, he's trying to win the ball back, he's trying to do all the stuff that has been leveled at him that he doesn't do. The problem is he's not very good at that, that's not his game. His game is getting in behind the, the striker to get on the end of chances and to create in the final third, well rather create, finish. And now he's trying to play in a position that's not really his, and at Everton, if he's a second striker, they already have Richarlison and Calvert-Lewin, so where's he going to get in the team? Does he play as an eight at the midfield two? It's unclear where he's going to fit in because the system 4-2-3-1, uh, if he's playing as a 10, there's not many teams that really have that. Everton haven't done that yet, and it means they put other players in different positions that don't suit them. So he's seen such struggles because he's been trying to do too much to make up for the things that have been leveled at him as being a weakness, and now he's just not the same player that he was when he broke through and had a bit more freedom as a forward. I think that's sort of it. That 16-17 season, 18 goals, 7 assists. Yeah. I'd kind of forgotten about that until you mentioned it, but that is incredible, isn't it? But that's when he was best, though, like the floating kind of player. Like we, was... we, I mean, we thought he was going to kick on to be one of the best in the world. Well, he came for England, yeah. He was PFA Young Player of the Year two years in a row, I think. I mean, he was, he was extraordinarily talented, but he's a really good example of why you should look at, at roles rather than positions. Because the type of eight, uh, sorry, type of ten that he is, is so unusual for how teams tend to play now. But also, he doesn't quite have the positional experience to play as an eight. So it's know. a different position altogether, right? Because you're trying to defend from the front from here. You'd normally be as a front two, trying to show the ball wide or whatever. But then you're trying to drop into a midfield two. That's a, just a different. That's covering a whole different part of the game. And he's naturally going to want to go into these positions where he, like, he's. Best when he's not really involved in play and then suddenly is involved. If he's here, you have to patrol this entire area. That's that's your job. But 
if you manage to float into here and you get between a couple of players who don't notice you're there, suddenly you're really useful in between the lines and you can do more with it. Well, under currently we're playing a back three. Deli Ali would maybe fit in as a 10, but he doesn't want to play that. He's playing a forward three. There's no real place for him. He can't play as an eight, can't play as a wide player. Now he's at Everton. Like I said, you've got Richarlison and Calvert Lewin who are going to be the two forwards. Probably they're playing a two. So you'll play a 3-5-2, that's the kind of players you'd have. If you change the system to 4-2-3-1, it depends whether where Richarlison goes, really. Here's a question. Do you think it's possible at all that, that you know, the style of football has just passed it by? I think of players like Meza Ozil, in some cases uh, Bruno Fernandes, now under Ralph Rangnick at Manchester United. When those players uh, don't have the completely free 10 role, they don't quite fit in to the modern game, but they grew up in a time when players like Wayne Rooney were, were all about it. I think it's a bit like that. I also think there's, I mean, I don't know this for certain, but for sure, but I'd imagine there's a little bit of, he suddenly had made it very early and a lot of professional elite football is about having the mentality to drive on beyond that, the kind of thing that you saw the Man United players that really came on and kept going and going and going. And where Harry Kane has managed to do that and keep pushing for it, there's been a lot of things said about Delhi that he's not done the work that he needs to have done. He's trying to correct that now, it seems like, but he may have derailed his career a little bit in doing so. But he's got a big money move to Everton. Maybe it'll all work out. David Kai. There you go. That's um, that's what that is. That's the answer. <laughs> yes. Next up, a question from Noah Freito Sweeney. If Bayern Munich had to play Joe Devine in any real position on the pitch for 70 minutes every game, where would be the most advantageous place to put him? And would they still win the league? <laughs> Alex Stewart. The only way to find out if Bayern Munich could still win the Bundesliga with Joe Devine playing was to be Bayern Munich with Joe Devine playing. So I created him in Football Manager. I knew I had to make his stats authentic. Joe is bad at football and brutally unhealthy, but he is tall, so that's good. Maybe he'd be best as a target man. Joe insisted his mental attributes should be outstanding, and since he is technically the leader of TIFO, I granted him this request. Tactically, I had to find a system that mitigated the fact that my lone striker had the acceleration of a glacier and the turning circle of a milk float on fire. And so I opted for a 4-1-4-1 with runners from deep, hoping that Joe's gravitational field would attract defenders and leave space for actual footballers. Our first test of Joe Devine playing for Bayern Munich was against Gladbach. We lost. The next was against Bochum. Here's Thomas Müller winning a penalty, giving Joe the chance to show his mettle. This does look quite a lot like a toe poke. A truly joyous moment. In fact, as the season continued, Joe consistently delivered from 12 yards, eventually scoring six from six penalties, but his first open play goal came against Greuther Firth. The thing is, everyone scores against Greuther, even Joe. Joe's role as a striker wasn't just about scoring goals. Here he is leading a ferocious press. And here he is scoring another penalty. After this match, my staff informed me that Joe had begun studying for a coaching course. I was concerned this could derail his focus, but a header and a penalty against Stuttgart assuaged my fears. Joe continued to try and contribute creatively, regularly setting up counter-attack opportunities for our rivals. And despite working hard in training, unfortunately every step forward was usually followed by two large steps back. Halfway through the season, we were second, which wasn't good enough. I had to have a word with our underperforming striker and told him he needed to improve. Joe agreed. So did Frank Ribéry. And then we crashed out of the Champions League. The press turned on Joe, but he answered his critics with another penalty, again against Greuter. The man loves to punch down. With the season almost at an end, our destiny was in Joe's giant hands. We were caught in a title race with arch-rivals Borussia Dortmund. Joe's year of hard work on the training ground meant he had improved his finishing and even raised his technique to one. But could he make the difference in the biggest game of the year? Joe's contribution to this clash was often limited while Erling Haaland showed him what we were missing. But Joe rose to the challenge once more. This ended a goal drought of 10 hours. The title had slipped from our grasp, although Joe's return of nine goals from 34 league appearances was unexpectedly high, it wasn't enough. We had failed because of Joe Devine. But we did win the Pockle, so that was nice. 
So full disclosure, uh, we actually ran this twice because the first time we did this, Alex, you were a little too kind to me in the attribute department and uh, I was too good. Yeah, so, I was uh, yeah. way too kind to the you. The second time around, <laughs> I did the attributes myself and I brought them way down. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I've, I've got them here. Let's just say your average physical would be about two and a half. Well, that seems that seems quite accurate. reasonable. Yeah. yeah, you you have been very kind to yourself uh, in terms of the mental stats. Well, I, don't, I wouldn't call it kind. Teamwork, just, yeah. leadership. The thing about the show, like, Tifo, we try to be accurate, and mm -hmm. that's you know, what did I get for leadership? Uh, that would be twenty, but then you are technically our boss, and you also so. scored that yourself yeah, as well. I scored all of those myself. Um, not enough for us to win the league under me, though, unfortunately. Second place. But I did play the 90 minutes of the of the, the Pokal final. You certainly did, yes, which yeah. we won 3-0 against uh, RB Leipzig. My one natural fitness there coming in real clutch towards the end of the season. Well, Noah Freito Sweeney, thank you for your question. You've been answered. <laughs> Stephen Agahi Murphy saying, Alexander Arnold recently said, if you look at the chances created, a lot of them are coming from that inside channel rather than the wing. They're all coming from the width of the penalty area. It's a nice area to create from, as you're a lot closer to the goal. The defenders have got a lot less time to react to it, and you can penetrate a lot more. Can you explain how and why chances are created from that inside channel other than less time? What are the difficulties opposition teams face in defending them? Alex. So Trent Alexander-Arnold is not unexpectedly completely right about this. It's a position that he's kind of made his own recently. It's this kind of area here that we're talking about. Now, this is sometimes known as the half space. You shouldn't really confuse the half space with the channel, which is the gap between a fullback and a centre back, but they do often equate to the same kind of thing. So why are chances from this area good? Well, if we put Alexander-Arnold out here on the wing, it's a lot easier to mark him. You can get two people here that can block a cross in. It basically only leaves passing angles backwards or inside, and the inside area much more congested, so it's easier to close this off. Centrally, that is a good area to create chances from as well, but there's a couple of key points. Let's say Firmino is the guy making this run forwards here. If the pass is coming like this, Firmino's probably got to have his back to goal because it's a classically vertical pass here. It makes it difficult for him to control it and then spin off. Or it means that the timing of that run has to be perfect. Obviously as well, centrally, it's a lot easier to congest and to mark, and that's why teams like to exploit wide areas. The half space is basically the classic combination of both things. So if Alexander-Arnold is here, then he can play passes at angles like this, for a player who's running on, they're not taking the ball with their back to a defender, they can make this run across here like that. He can get whip or curve into that area as well. And although defenders can stand him up, there is also always the option to play a pass outside here as well on the overlap. So it basically gives you maximum passing angles, you're closer to goal, and the angles that you can create are more dangerous because players are moving forwards rather than being static. If you have a look here at this screen, uh, Mark Carey uh, has produced this for us. This is up to the end of January, and you can see that Alexander-Arnold's open chance creation, this is that kind of half space channel that he's talking about here. It absolutely mirrors what we're saying. This is where he is creating his best stuff from. Now that can be quite close to the touchline here, these pulled back crosses here, sometimes it's from really deep, and that's the kind of area that you'll see Kevin De Bruyne creating from a lot as well. One last quick thing to look at here as well is Alexander Arnold's own evolving play as a footballer. Now, obviously, this is partly reflective of Liverpool's tactical changes. We've seen Jurgen Klopp use his fullbacks in different ways, but if we go back to 2018 19, here we can see the majority of these chance creation locations really quite wide. This is where he's coming through on the overlap and firing those crosses in. As we move forwards here, it's starting to be more diffuse. This is where he's moving further and further in towards where we finally see him getting this classic half space. Now, as I said before, some of these are from really close to the byline. That's that kind of pulled back cross that Manchester City like to do as well. But some of them are from this deeper sort of position here, again, where Kevin De Bruyne is also firing in those bended crosses from. So in short, yes, the half space, great place to create from, and Alexander-Arnold's game has shifted towards that himself. Talk about half spaces, uh, my favorite kind of space, crawl space. I like to hide. 
The crawl space is just is just an American thing, isn't it? From in houses and TV shows in America. Well, I, I only hide in America. You don't have a crawl space in your house. Well, I, any space I crawl in is a crawl space. <laughs> You're gonna crawl into, it. yeah. Let's do the next question. Time for the final question. Alorog seven four five. Alorog seven four five asks. Do you think it's realistic for any non-old firm team to win the Scottish League in the next 10 years or so? JJ Bull. So, the last team outside of Celtic or Rangers, the old firm, to win the Scottish Premiership was Aberdeen, and that was in 1985. So I think it's unlikely anyone's going to win it in the next 10 years. And I can show you with some data to do with money uh, why that's definitely the case. There's an economic model, there's a book called Soccernomics, and in that, they say that the team who spends the most on wages is most likely to win. That makes sense. But it's not to do with transfers, how much you spend on transfers. It's the team who spends the most on wages tends to win. Now, if we look at the, uh, this is the data I got for the 2019-20 season in the Scottish Premiership, and this ended early because of this thing called coronavirus you may have heard of before. But this is, the, this is how the, the wages are split. And as you can see, it's slightly imbalanced. Celtic won the league this year. Rangers finished second. And uh, Motherwell, way down here, they finished third on a points per game basis. Aberdeen finished fourth. They were expected to finish third, but didn't. And as you can see, this is quite a big difference, right? But if we compare this to the English Premier League, we can see where the sort of differences come in. This is the English Premier League from the same season. That's Celtic for comparison, obviously a lot smaller, but that's not what we're talking about. Now, if we consider like the old firm to be the teams most likely to always win the league or expected to, you can call it in England kind of the top five. So it's Man City, Man United, Liverpool, Arsenal, Chelsea. I'd say they're the top five. Um, Spurs maybe just outside it, right? Is possibly the sixth. Now, as you can see here, Liverpool won the league this year, right? This is them here. This is in dollars, but we converted it into pounds. Don't worry about it too much. Compared to Leicester, who finished outside the top four, they finished fifth, which is very good for them to do that. This is them here. That looks, that looks like a big, that looks like a big jump, right? So you think, well, wow, well done, Leicester. They've done really well to do that. But if we do this, so Leicester finished fifth. The difference in average wages to first, which is Liverpool. Um, it was 1.65. So for every pound that Leicester spent, Liverpool spent £1.65 on wages. Now, Motherwell finished third. The difference in average wages to first is 15.1. This is more. Quite a lot more. We can then take that and look at Liverpool's average annual wage per player in 2019-20, right? So they spent £5.1 million per player on average. So that's the average salary per player. But if Liverpool were the equivalent of Celtic, and Leicester with equivalent of Motherwell. This would be like instead of Liverpool paying 5.1 million per player, they instead spent 46.7 million pounds per player. This is more. And this is what it would look like. Which is quite a lot, as you can see there. Now, that's sort of where we're looking at in Scotland. So the Premier League looks like this. The Scottish Premiership looks like this. Um, these numbers may look a bit closer than you think when you compare it to like over here, but it's not, it's miles away. Now, how about we think about just transfers? So sure enough, the model doesn't say that the more you spend on transfers, you're guaranteed to win. That's not how it works, it's the wages. But if we look at transfers, what we find is uh, something else very interesting. Now, this is from this season, the 2021-22 season, right? The total spent by non-old firm teams, so teams who aren't Rangers and Celtic, is 1.8 million. And that's actually quite a lot in uh, the Scottish Premiership. That's quite a lot for the season. Aberdeen spent quite a bit of money, for example, right? Now, um, the total spent by the old firm in the 21-22 season, 26.5 million pounds. This is quite a lot more. So if we look, for example, Aberdeen's transfer spend, and they are most likely to challenge Celtic or Rangers outside of the old firm. This is the team most likely to do it. Aberdeen spent £560,000 uh, this, this year and Celtic spent £24.5 million. That is a multiplier of 43.75. So it's quite big, it's quite a lot more money. Let's compare it to something that more people know about. Now Man United, um, they finished second last season, right? Spurs, the team most likely to finish outside of the old firms of Man United and Liverpool and City and Chelsea, whatever you want to call them, right? So Spurs' transfer spend is 86.3 million pounds. Now, if that were the equivalent, and Spurs, like uh, like Aberdeen, were trying to get into the finished second even, 
And uh, Man United, who did finish second, so if this was 86.3 million times 43.75, they instead spent 3.7 billion. This is more. <laughs> so you can kind of see the problem here. This is a lot more money than this, and this is what Aberdeen would be like trying to challenge Celtic, who finished second. So do I think it's realistic that in the next 10 years or so, a team non outside of the old firm will win the Scottish Premiership? No, I don't think anyone will ever win it because I think it's completely broken. Da, 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 da. Ah, there we go, it's the end of the show. But before we leave today, a question for you at home and maybe for you boys here as well. If there was a 1% chance that when you went to the toilet in your home, there was a bear in there, would you go? <laughs> Leave your response in the comments below. JJ, what about you there, pal? Yes. And with that, we say goodbye. Uh, thanks for watching. If you'd like us to answer a question on this show, do pop it in the comments below. But for now, that's all from Alex Stewart, from JJ Bull, and from me, Joe Devine. Goodbye. <laughs>